So we know that different uh, we know that different languages, both spoken and signed, um, choose to order their words differently. It's well known, for instance, that some languages are SVO while others are SOV, and the reasons underlying these ordering preferences have been widely debated. Um, less studied are the ordering biases um, with respect to nouns and their adjectives. Within the noun phrase, there are two different ways to order the noun and its adjective. One option is to have the adjective first and the noun last. And if you're a speaker of a language like English or Mandarin, um, this is what you do. Um, another option is to put the noun first. And if you are a speaker of a language like Spanish or Vietnamese, um, this is what you will also, this is what you will tend to do. And in fact, um, it's this noun first order that appears to be most common among the world's spoken language. So specifically for spoken languages where there is a dominant order, uh, nearly two thirds of those languages order nouns before adjectives. And among the world's uh, signed languages, this same tendency um, to order nouns before adjectives is also present, um, although the preference appears to be weaker than in spoken languages. And as we just learned from Layla, this actually appears to be the same order that is overwhelmingly present in CTSL as well. Um, so this is compared to the roughly one third of languages that order adjectives before nouns. Um, and a clear minority of languages um, that can mix and match. And so in terms of cross-linguistic patterns, uh, this tendency to order nouns before adjectives is pretty strong. So the question <clears throat> that we want to ask is, um, well, what contributes to this cross-linguistic bias towards the noun first order? And we're going to attempt to answer this question um, by looking at data from two different studies. Uh, we're first going to see uh, to ask whether there's a cognitive bias for the noun before adjective order and ask if one of the reasons for this cross-linguistic bias, um, uh, as in the case of SOV word orders, is a natural cognitive bias towards one order, in our case, the noun first order. And we'll do this by looking at a corpus of elicited productions from three cohorts of NSL, um, an emerging language, and that's experiment 1A. And then in experiment 1B uh, or study 1B, we're going to look at a corpus of elicited productions from US-based English-speaking silent gestures. Um, and the purpose of this was to get a first look at whether we, there might be any evidence of a cognitive bias for uh, the noun first order. Um, and as a side note, we tried to look at data from home signers from Nicaragua, Nicaragua and Guatemala. Um, however, because of the uh, paucity of utterances among those groups that were analyzable, um, it was simply not possible to get a clear picture of the data. Okay. Um, then in experiment two, we're going to further contextualize um, those cognitive biases and see how they interact with the other factors that might drive the development of a linguistic bias. Oops. Okay, so jumping into the corpus um, studies. Um, as I mentioned before, um, these corpuses, these corpora were analyzed, uh, we analyzed, um, elicited productions from three cohorts of NSL for, and from English speaking silent gestures. Both groups watched the exact same set of videos depicting um, simple, uh, a, somewhat atypical events. So something like this. Um, and then they were asked to describe what happened in the video so that someone who couldn't see the screen could actually um, understand what happened. Um, and there was no mention in the instructions about nouns or modifiers or how detailed participants to be uh, besides this. So um, I'm going to show you now a sample excerpt um, from one of our NSL1 participants describing the paintbrush uh, event that you saw. And as a heads up, um, she's going to do a very small, quick uh, motion for the paintbrush at the very beginning. So it's just very small. And then she'll describe the dimensions of the paintbrush. Um, so as you saw there, that was the noun first and then add, add modifier after. Um, but, uh, so, but after excluding ambiguous cases, um, we were left with a total of 223 utterances for the NSL cohorts, and then 276 um, utterances from the silent gesture group. Um, and I want to note that the reason why I'm calling um, it modifier in, these, um, in, in this uh, description here, and not adjective in the context of this corpus study, was because we couldn't really distinguish between adjective modifiers versus relative clause modifiers like cat that is black. Um, so we sort of included all of them. 
Um, but for each utterance, uh, we coded for NP order, whether it was noun first or noun last. And because all the actions in the videos were atypical, we didn't have to worry about confusing references to the object versus actions to the video. Um, but as you can imagine, deciding whether something was a noun or a modifier was something complex. Um, so sometimes we had some more clear cut easy cases like finger spellings or point gestures um, or gestures referring to you know, small or black, which are um, pretty clear. Um, but determining whether something was a noun or modifier was often dependent entirely on the context of the rest of the utterance. So um, at a very broad level, we defined nouns as the gestures being modified or constrained, while modifiers were defined as the gesture uh, doing the constraining or whose meaning was dependent on the meaning of the other gesture. So for instance, if uh, we had somebody doing something like a square um, and then this pushing fabric gesture, um, we called the square gesture the noun because there are many things in the world that are square. Um, and then the, we called the pushing gesture the modifier because it helped uh, to us to tell, tell us what square did. Um, and there's going to be, a, a, and I'm glossing over many details, so um, in the interest of time, but do feel free to ask me about the coding um, later. Um, what I'm going to show you now is the data from experiment one, our three NSL cohorts. And what I've done is taken the average proportion across all individuals, and I want to draw your attention to what's happening in the first column. So here I'm going to give you the percentage of noun first utterances with raw counts in parentheses. And off the bat, you can see that the preference for the noun first order is pretty high for folks in the NSL cohorts, um, definitely significantly above chance levels. And you can also see that these cohorts don't differ from each other. Now let's look at the picture from silent gestures. Uh, we also see that the noun first order is preferred significantly above chance levels, but noticeably this bias is significantly less robust than compared to NSL cohorts. And our statistical analyses confirmed these. Statistically, we found no difference between our NSL groups, but we did find a difference between NSL and silent gestures. And if I wanted to take a closer look at the results broken down by individual, we use, uh, individuals, yeah, we actually see a very similar picture. Um, so here, what I've done is I've looked at each individual's data and um, divided folks into majority noun firsters, majority noun lasters, and even splitters um, by their utterances. Um, and here too, we find that within each language group, folks tend to be noun firsters. So, um, the first important point from our results is that in line with what we might expect given the cross-linguistic patterns, we do find evidence of a cognitive bias towards the noun first order um, among signers of an emerging language and among silent gestures whose native language is actually now last. Um, the second important finding from these two, exper uh, from these two uh, studies um, is with respect to the strength of the noun first bias. So in particular, we found the bias is stronger for NSL than for gestures. Um, and this is interesting because it suggests that something else beyond the cognitive bias is at play. And whatever it is, it's amplifying that underlying bias. So for instance, um, if it's just a simple cognitive bias for the noun first order that drives that noun first pattern cross-linguistically, um, then we might expect everybody to look like our silent gestures. Um, instead, what we're seeing is that folks who are learning a language are producing the noun first bias at higher rates than those are quote, who are quote unquote creating that language. So um, to further explore why there was a stronger bias amongst our NSL groups compared to our silent gesture group, we conducted study two. And here the goal was to see how a different part of the puzzle, namely learning, could contribute to the picture. Um, and learning here seems to be a good candidate for helping us to explain that stronger bias in NSL cohorts, um, because we know from prior work that learners of a language have a bias to regularize unpredictable variation in the input from their models. Um, we've seen evidence for this from the classic case of Simon, um, a deaf child who also regularized input from his non-native signing parents. And we've also seen this in the lab among both children and adults who learn um, artificial languages. Um, and so in study two, we were particularly interested in two questions. First, um, is the stronger noun first bias in NSL versus sound gesture groups due, due to regularization during learning? 
And second, given the cognitive bias towards noun first, would people regularized more readily towards that noun first bias or to um, the noun last than, than compared to the noun last word? And so to that end, we designed a regularization study um, to see uh, whether people would regularize towards the noun first order when they were given variable input. Um, so for this, we recruited 160 participants from the internet. They were all native speakers of English with little to no language, uh, sign language exposure. And following the traditional uh, structure of a regularization study, we first trained our participants on some input language. And then at test, uh, we uh, looked to see what they had learned from that language. Um, so let's take a look first at the structure of the training phase. So during the training phase, people watched a total of 12 clips. These clips depict, uh, depicted three distinct events, each of which was repeated four times. And they're all simple events, like the one you're going to see here with the paintbrush item. Participants were told to watch each of the videos carefully because they need to remember that for the task later. So here's the simple event. Um, and after each video, um, each event video, they saw a gesture vignette that described the item in either the noun first or noun last orders. So here you're seeing a training uh, video produced in the noun first order. So noun, then adjective, oh, sorry, that's the wrong order. <laughs> that's the uh, adjective and then noun and then verb. So that's the noun first order. Um, so critically, participants were actually trained on both orders, um, just in different proportions. So for example, in the training condition that I just showed you there, that was an instance of noun, adjective, verb. And if we uh, were participants in this first condition um, here, in that teal color, you would actually have seen the paintbrush video three more times, but those remaining trials would have been in the noun last, so adjective, noun, verb, order. Um, those proportions would have been reversed in the second condition. You probably also noticed that the verb in that gesture was produced last. Um, we also had variants of the same thing where the verb was produced first. And this was strictly for counterbalancing purposes because our predictions in this study um, did not rely on the position of the verb at all. Um, and as you'll see, we actually don't get any differences based on verb position. Uh, but what's important to take from this design is that we actually have in each of our conditions the same amount of unpredictable variation in the input. All that differs is which order occurred most frequently. So what did the test phase look like? Um, there were 16 total trials. 12 were the trials that were exactly the same videos that the people saw during training. Um, and in addition, we included four completely new events um, that were also repeated four times. Uh, so one new event that was repeated four times. Um, that previously unseen event ended up not being different than any of the scene trials. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna collapse the differences between those. Um, but, the other, but the structure was otherwise the same during training. So you saw the event video. And then after the video clip, you were asked to click on the gesture video that best described the event. And we showed participants uh, the two gesture vignettes that, um, oh, and we showed participants the two gesture vignettes that they'd seen during training and played them on a loop, as you can see here, so that participants had the opportunity to watch both vignettes before they were required to choose. Um, and as you can see, these videos are virtually identical except for the order in which the gesture appeared. Um, so let's take a look at the proportion of noun first selections that people made in each uh, condition. So in the bottom X axis here, I've listed the four conditions with the majority order. So the order that folks see 75% of the time listed first in each of the pairs. Um, and on the Y axis, I've listed the proportion of expected, i.e. noun first order selections for each participant. And to help us, I've color coded things so that the conditions where the majority of the input is down last is teal and the majority of the noun first is coral. So what did we find? Um, in the teal noun last or orders, uh, we find that proportion of noun first selections is well above what they got in training. Um, and you can tell this is the case because the error bars marking the 95% confident intervals are well above the dashed lines that indicate the input proportions for the fat noun first order in that condition. So even the folks, so even though the folks in that teal condition um, only saw the noun first order 25% of the time, they produced the noun first order at much higher rates. 
So in other words, the people in the majority noun last condition are changing their input. Um, yes, are changing their input in a pretty interesting way. Um, they're not rather than simply adopting the order that they got, got most frequently, um, they actually appear to be moving towards the less frequent, more natural noun first order. Okay, um, what about folks in the noun uh, first condition? Um, well, here we see the mean proportion of noun first selections is around 75, uh, roughly what they received in training. And at first glance, this sort of looks like folks in this choral condition are just proportion matching. Um, but let's see what is actually happening when we use a metric that can tap into regularization uh, a bit more clearly. Um, before I do that, though, let me go ahead and show you what I mentioned earlier, namely that we got the same patterns um, when the verb was first. So following others, um, the metric that we're going to use to get at this question of whether people are regularizing their input is an entropy change score. Um, and what this measures is the change in the amount of variation at people's responses at test um, minus their response, uh, the amount of variation um, that they got during training, um, which if you recall is actually the same across all conditions because everybody saw the two orders in the same 75-25 split. And the idea is, um, that if people were regularizing their input, then what we would actually see is a negative entropy change score, um, because this is where we should see less, uh, less variation at test than at training. So I'm going to give you the four conditions that you saw on the x-axis again, but instead of plotting the proportion of uh, noun first selections, I'm going to plot the entropy change. And so starting again with our teal conditions, we don't find any evidence of irregularization. And you see that because um, the 95% confidence intervals uh, overlap with the zero line, meaning that there was no change, that meaning that the change in entropy in these conditions is not significantly different than zero. Um, and this shouldn't be surprising though, because we just saw from the previous graph that people were in fact not decreasing uh, variability. They were in fact increasing variation by overproducing the noun first order. Um, but in these choral conditions, where it initially looked like people were just proportion matching, we do find significant differences from zero. So here, the 95% confidence intervals bars don't overlap with the zero line, uh, meaning that as we predicted, people were regularizing towards the noun first order in these conditions. So it's not the case that they were just proportion matching. They're, they were actually also changing their input. Um, and they could have made things more variable or less variable. Um, but in fact, the people in the noun first condition were choosing to make that uh, their input less variable. Uh, we simply couldn't see that in the proportion plots because the folks in that coral group didn't have a lot of space to move up in terms of proportions of selections while the teal, um, the teal folks did. Um, but we, when we use that, this more direct metric of regularization, like entropy change, we find that they are, in fact, the coral um, folks are regularizing in the noun first condition, but not in the noun last condition. And that's true um, regardless of the position of the verb. Um, and in fact, if you did a count of the number of regularizers versus non-regularizers, you would actually find twice as many regularizers in these noun first conditions compared to the noun last conditions. Um, so what did we find from study two? Well, we showed that people regularize towards the noun first order more willingly than in the noun last orders, even though they saw, this, the, the, they saw competing orders in the same exact proportions. And these results um, provide evidence for the possibility that the stronger and, uh, noun first bias for NSL versus silent gestures may indeed be due to regularization biases associated with language learning. Taken together, um, these studies that I've shown you today point to at least two factors contributing to the tendency towards the noun first order across linguistically. First is the cognitive bias from the noun first order, and evidence for this came from an emerging language and silent gesture. And second is the learning bias amplifying the strength of those underlying cognitive bias, and that came from experiment two. And at a broader level, these uh, results suggest that the strength of a cross-linguistic bias reflects an interaction between the creation processes and learning processes. Um, that is, we shouldn't expect the strength of a cross-linguistic bias to map directly onto the strength of the bias at the individual level. Instead, that bias is the outcome of how these two um, biases interact. 
So um, as a first look, there's, uh, these results are super promising and we're really excited to be able to get your feedback here, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done, especially to follow up on an important implication of our study, namely that language creators and language learners contribute differently to the development of a language. And we don't have evidence from home signers, but um, so in the interim, we're sticking to our silent gestures. Um, but we are doing a controlled lab study to um, help us pull apart effects uh, uh, um, to, to, with the stimuli adjusted so that to more concretely pick up on noun gestures and uh, modifier gestures. Um, in addition, I want to stress that we're at this part point looking at nothing that is even close to communication. Um, and so we're missing out on the wealth of effects um, tied to entrainment or alignment between speakers. And finally, um, we didn't show evidence of regularization towards that now last order, but these orders do exist in language. So an important question is how those now last orders develop um, in spite of the factors that are pushing towards the development towards now first orders. Um, so with that, I will thank um, our sponsors and our collaborators. And I apologize for going over time. Thank you so much. Um, now it's time for the discussion. And we have eight minutes for questions and comments. So any junior researchers or students would like to go um, first and ask questions. You, you may raise your hand from the reaction so I can see um, who is willing to do so. Okay, so we can move to um, senior researchers. Um, Professor Sandler, uh, you may unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, <clears throat> very interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you uh, checked it all for the prosody of the, um, <clears throat> of, the, of the stimuli and the responses. And the reason I ask is because we were interested in word order in a Bedouin sign language. And one of our examples was um, <clears throat> something, it was a, a subject, verb, object, which was not the general order that we got. But when we looked more closely, we found that there was a big prosodic break between the verb and the object. So instead of saying, <clears throat> build walls, doors, he was actually saying, we began to build walls, doors. So we know, we know that there's a sort of a topic comment um, preference in language. So, how do you know what 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 you're get with whether what you're getting is topic noun first and then comment, which is quite general regardless of word order within a sentence, and uh, uh, the difference between that and say sentential word word order of words within a sentence. <clears throat> Um, so actually, um, sorry. So we have not looked at prosody at all, and um, this is a little bit um, just due to the fact that coding what we had took um, a lot of um, effort as it is. But I, you're right. Um, we weren't able. There's just a lot of things that we weren't able to very cleanly decide between, um, and in addition to these prosodic breaks that might mark topic comment. Um, that, that might these these that might um, adjective versus noun. They may actually also potentially delineate between um, you know adjectives versus relative clause modifiers. So that's um, I, I I I we haven't thought about going back to that at all um, at this. But I'll definitely make a note of that because you're right that there's it's yeah <laughs> at this point we've collapsed it all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have one more question um, by Dr. Raviv. You can unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, hi, Monica. It was um, a really good presentation and a really inspiring research. And I have, maybe it's a naive question because I'm not, uh, you know, um, but I will, so when you talk about the noun bias, I wonder how much of this can be kind of offloaded to things like, agency or animacy because I don't know if I understood the uh, the stimuli correct but I had the feeling that in all the cases you have a human doing something with a brush or a human doing something with some and how so how do you kind of refine or nuance what is this bias actually about so what is it that people want to front 
So in the corpus, we took any utterances, whether it referred to the agent or the patient, any, anything at all that had both a noun and a modifier. Um, so uh, the numbers that we have sort of collapsed across those two categories. Um, I will say looking at the data, I didn't see any, um, uh, so we haven't analyzed animates versus inanimate utterances separately. And I will make a note to do that because that's, um, there's, yeah, there's interesting, um, there's animacy matters a lot for many other things. So I wouldn't be uh, necessarily surprised if we found something different here. Um, cursorily, um, having gone through the data, I didn't see anything jumping out as, you know, a tendency towards, um, um, uh, you know, the, the noun last for inanimates versus animates. Um, it seemed pretty, um, pretty fairly spread, uh, evenly spread throughout our uh, items, but that's first glance and I'd have to do more to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one um, more question by Dr. Shastra. Uh, you may unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you very much. This was very interesting. Um, we have a, a paper uh, together with uh, Yasmin Motamedi and um, Simon Kirby um, and others, um, or, and Danielle Negley, who is also here, I think, uh, and Lucy. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I mentioned that, all the authors now. Um, and we worked on um, basic word order. It was uh, uh, a, uh, a similar study with a similar setup. And we found a similar result in the sense that people, um, when they were trained on word orders, um, even when there was very little evidence for natural word orders, they, they flipped, they went uh, in the direction of naturalness, uh, which was against our uh, expectation. Oh at the time, um, but your results seem to reinforce this. And I, I'm wondering about what, like, what's your take on this? But do you expect, like, what do you think of naturalness and um, where can we expect to see this? Uh, that's a great question. It's something Simon and I have discussed, Simon and Susan and I have discussed at great lengths. Um, it's not totally sure yet. So we actually did do the correlate to this um, study was actually also the noun verb side. Um, so we did, um, so we did look, we also had four additional conditions where we looked at regularization in the context of uh, noun verb. And, um, and they don't behave the same uh, as in the uh, as in the uh, adjective noun cases, so um, whereas we did so in this adjective noun case, we had a reinforcing of that natural bias. We didn't necessarily have that in their our noun verbs, which is um, sort of um, what you are saying um, with um, the, the the work you did with Yasmin, um, where it seemed like the noun bias in that case was a little bit less. Um, uh, dominant, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and it's, it's, we're throwing around a few different ideas. Um, one possibility is that um, your work in, among them, there have been many studies um, showing that there's many things that can modulate that noun, uh, that noun uh, verb ordering bias, intentional, extensional events, learning a lexicon, um, things, uh, you know, animacy, so there's, it's possible that that noun verb bias is just a bit um, more susceptible to those other modulating factors than the noun adjective bias. Um, that's, um, and this is sort of in some ways represented in the way that the cross-linguistic um, uh, numbers sort of play out. Um, so that noun adjective bias is, um, fairly overwhelming um, compared to the 50-50 that you see in noun verb. Um, so that's one avenue that we're exploring. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing is that um, it, with, with video data like this that we saw, it seems that the verb is quite salient um, when we have uh, stimuli such as this. And so in these sort of description studies, um, it, it may have some, uh, they, they may reflect some, uh, some effective salience. So you will find this uh, 
verb noun order uh, more often because it allows to, uh, people to put the most salient thing about an event video, the verb, the action, um, first. And uh, we did see that most people actually do want to think just about the verb in some later production studies. Um, in the case of noun adjective, um, adjectives just don't tend to be produced all that much except in a very specific um, uh, like referentially uh, promiscuous, uh, pr permissive, sorry, permissive context. Um, so it may be something about um, the, the, the relative salience of these elements in the event as well. Um, I have no idea at the moment, but it is something that we uh, are actively pursuing. So thank you, uh, Monica, and thanks everyone for the discussion. Now we'll move on to the third and the last presentation by Annie Halls and